You know how we usually think of memory as like something personal, something happening just in our minds? Right. Well, get ready for a real mind bend. Yeah. Because with Michelle Sarah's Lincolnescent, mm-hmm. we're not just looking at memories in our heads, uh, no. but how memory itself yeah. is like woven into like the fabric of everything. Yeah, it's a, from uh, mountains. It's a really different way of thinking about it. To microbes. And what's so fascinating about Sarah's is how he pushes us beyond that very limited view that we have. He wants us to see the world around us, not just as, like you said, this collection of objects, right? but as this huge interconnected tapestry yeah. of time. <laughs> okay, so unpack that a little bit, because yeah. he uses this image of a kid playing, right, like yeah. in front of their house, yeah. and he's describing, to, you know, the child's game, which is fleeting, <laughs> right? and then the house, which could be decades old, yes. or centuries old, exactly. and then he brings in the river. Yes. That's slowly carving through rock formations over yep. millennia. Deep time. And all of that's under the gaze of the sun. It's amazing. It's, it's like he's highlighting all these different tempos. Uh, yeah. Yeah. He's highlighting the different tempos of the world and showing how something as ordinary as a child playing outside oh, it... is actually a meeting point right. for these vastly different scales uh, of time. Yeah. And it's all connected. Yeah. It's all part of what he calls the grand recit, okay. the grand narrative. So it's not just about like expanding how we think about time. Right. It's about seeing everything as part of one single story. Precisely. Right. The Big Bang, the formation of stars, life emerging on Earth, human evolution. It's right. All part of this one grand narrative. Right. And each event, each stage leaves a trace, a memory. Right. It really challenges us to rethink any kind of narrow view of history. Oh, absolutely. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's not just about like what's written down yeah. or what we've recorded, you know. In the last little bit. In the last couple thousand That's, years. Yeah, right. right. Sarah's wants us to think about billions of years. Yes. Of cosmic history and natural history. Deep time. That came before. Yeah. All those layers. All of it. What he calls deep time. Yeah. And speaking of layers. Okay. This is where it gets really wild for me. He doesn't just stop at mountains and rivers. Yeah. He actually compares, like, geological strata. Okay. So those layers of rock that we see Uh to a form of cold memory. It's such a powerful image. It is. Because those layers, they hold fossils. Right. You know, actual remnants of ancient life. It's like looking back in time. It's literally looking back in time. Yeah. He even says, all things in principle behave like memories. The universe bank contains accounts. That's incredible. It's beautiful. Yeah. And, you know, knowing your interest in genealogy. Oh, yeah. This next part, I think, will really resonate with you. Okay. So, in addition to the geological strata, right. he also points to DNA yeah. as this memory bank. Yes. But this time it's dynamic. Right. This time it's not cold. It's alive. <laughs> it's carrying the history of life itself within our very cells. It's an amazing thought. To have our own ancestral archive right there. Right. Right there in our DNA. I mean, that's just wild. It's amazing. And what's even more fascinating is that Sarah's doesn't even stop there. Right. He goes on to suggest that as we evolve as humors uh-huh. and we develop these really complex cultures. Right. That we actually kind of step outside of that flow. Oh, really? Of natural memory. Interesting. In a way. So, okay, we've got mountains as memories. Yes. DNA is memories. Uh He even says, living species are places of memory. Humans leave these places. Wow. What does that even mean? It's a big question. Like, are we forgetting something? As we become more cultural, Mm -hmm. you're forgetting something essential. That is the million dollar question. Yeah. It's as though by developing these complex cultures and these incredible technologies. Right. We've built a separate memory palace okay, filled with symbols and language and these big abstract ideas. Which brings us to those white concepts. Yes. Right? Yes. Freedom, knowledge. Freedom, knowledge, invention. Invention. Love. Yeah. It's almost like he's saying those aren't just things that philosophers came up with. Exactly. But they're products of our deprogrammed bodies. Yes. So there's a lot to unpack there. Absolutely. Because I feel like. And knowing your love for philosophy. Oh, yeah. This is where Sarah's really kind of blows the doors off. He sees these white concepts as emerging from our physical existence. 
from our very human ability to adapt and to create, to go beyond instinct. Interesting. It's not about separating culture from nature, okay. but recognizing culture as this extension of it. So instead of culture versus nature, it's more like culture rising out of nature. Yes. Interesting. And it's our bodies that are both capable of, yes. you know, great invention, great creation. Of course. But also... And destruction. Destruction. Our deprogrammed bodies, they're capable of both. Right. And that's the starting point for culture itself. And that's the tension, right? Exactly. Because he's acknowledging yes. that culture has led to amazing things. Art, science. Art, well, science. Yeah. Literature. Literature. Everything. But also, he's not shying away from the f bad stuff. Ugh. The dark side. He says, our cruelty comes from the fact that our symbolic life plays with our objective life. It's like we're constantly grappling with yeah. the consequences of what we create. Always. Yeah. Always trying to figure out how to handle the power. Right. And where does that leave us, you know, in well, terms of... What does that leave us in terms of... The local and the global. Yes. Because there is that feeling yeah. that we can't just retreat into these little bubbles right. of localness. It's not that simple. Right. You're absolutely right. Sarah's argues that to really understand culture, right. you have to balance both yeah. those local specificities and yeah. our interconnectedness right. on a global scale. Yeah. And he uses these great examples, you know, like agriculture. Right. Scientific knowledge. Right. Even language. Right. To show how these global exchanges have shaped us. Okay, so how do we navigate that? Yeah, because it does feel like this constant pull. push and pull, right? It is. Of like wanting to preserve... Of course. ...the uniqueness yeah. of certain cultures. Right. But also, we have to exist. But also, the world is getting smaller. In a global world. It is, and Cirrus doesn't pretend to have all the answers. Right. But... What's interesting is how he uses language as an example. Okay. He talks about how languages are constantly evolving. Right. They borrow words and ideas and concepts from each other. Right. And it really reflects how cultures have mixed throughout yeah. all of history. Okay. It's really fascinating. Well, and I know that resonates with you with all the travel that you've done. Yeah. yeah. And the languages that you've learned. Of course. Yeah. I mean, for me, each language has been a new lens. Right. To see the world through right. a new way to understand yeah. the human experience and how yeah. we communicate. Right. But, you know, yeah. Sarah Ress also cautions against this kind of naive okay. embrace of globalization. Right. That just erases right. local differences. Right. We also have to value that what? uniqueness, right. unique perspectives and knowledge right. that come from specific cultural contexts. So it's not an either or. It's both and. Exactly. Right? We have to find a way to hold both yeah. to recognize the value of yeah. each. And that leads us to, I think, a more yeah. maybe somber, but really crucial right. part of Sarah's thinking. Yeah. He doesn't shy away from yeah. the tragic dimensions of our existence, right. both in the natural world uh -huh. and in the cultural world. Right. He sees violence suffering even death as like right. woven into the oh. fabric of life right it's just there it's part of it he writes our individual existence and our cultural histories plunge into the grand narrative along with the walls and the chamois yeah it's this really stark reminder that we're all yeah. part of this grand unfolding story right. and it has both beauty mm -hmm. and brutality yeah and i think that's where this idea of homo humilis comes in exactly right the humble human. Yes. It's like we need that humility to face this reality. Exactly. This reality of interconnectedness with all of it. Yes. You know, the joy and the suffering. It's all part of it. Yeah. We can't have one without the other. And we need that humility to face. And recognize each other. other. Yes. You know, with all of our flaws and our differences. And our shared humanity. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Sariessi sees this homo humilis as the antidote okay. to that arrogance that yep. often comes with yeah. human achievement. Right. You know, a truly global perspective yeah. means moving beyond just our own narrow self-interest right. and embracing this yeah. shared responsibility yeah. for humanity and for the planet. Which is a really radical thought. It is. In a world that's obsessed with, you know, yeah. exactly. the individual and individual achievement. To self, yeah. Yeah. So how do we cultivate that? Right. That homo humilis perspective. It's the question. Yeah. It's a big question. And Sarah's doesn't offer easy answers. 
but he does offer us these beautiful metaphors yeah. Yeah. for this journey toward the universal. Yeah. He uses dance, music. He even uses the image of flowing water okay. to illustrate this movement right. toward greater understanding and connection. Wow. He writes, diverse, we hesitate toward the universal. Our cogitations stir toward the truth like birds flutter in a whirlwind toward their destination. Right. It's this constant striving and reaching for something larger than right. ourselves. Yeah. Wow. So we've covered a lot of ground here. We have. We've talked about mountains as these memory palaces. We've gone into the depths of our DNA. Uh -huh. We've looked at... The vastness of time. The yeah. balance of the local and the global. Yes. The hard reality. The difficult reality. Of the human condition. Yeah. Yes. So if we were to just distill it, like, what's the big takeaway? That's a great question. What does Sarah's want us to grapple with? What does he want us to grapple with? I think yeah. at the heart of it... Yeah. Is this idea yeah. that we are not just separate uh, individuals, right. but part of this yeah. vast interconnected yeah. web of being. Right. And yeah. that yeah. our memories, our experiences are not just personal, but right. they're also collective. Yeah. Right. And they're woven into the very fabric yeah. of the cosmos. So what does that mean for us? What does that mean for us? That's the question. Yeah. I mean, like... That's what he wants us to think about. It feels hopeful. Yeah. But there's also this weight to it, right? There is. Yeah. Because it's not a passive hope. Right. It's an active hope. Okay. How so? Because it requires effort on our part. All right. It requires us to be aware. Right. To be willing yeah. to engage. Yeah. And I think this is where his idea of moving towards the universal fits in. Okay. It's not about erasing our differences. Right. But it's about building those bridges. Right. It's about finding that common ground. Because ultimately, that's the only way forward. Yeah. And he's asking us to do this. He is. In the face. Yes. Uh, knowing that there's suffering in the world. He's not asking us to shy away from it. Right. He's asking us to face it head on. Right. But to do it yeah. with this understanding of our interconnectedness uh, and our shared humanity. Right. And I think that's a really well, powerful. It is a powerful message. It is. Yeah. So he's not sugarcoating anything. No. No sugarcoating. But he's also saying that there's a way... But there's a possibility. Forward. There is. There's always possibility. And a lot of that has to do with how we view ourselves. Yeah, ourselves in relation to the world. Right. In relation to each other. Right. That's what he keeps coming back to. Yeah. And that homo humilis. Yes. It's a choice, right? It's a choice. It's a way of being. Yeah. It's a way of seeing. Right. It's a way of acting. And that's hopeful. It is hopeful. Yeah. And you know what's even more hopeful yeah. is he gives us these concrete things we can do. Like what? To cultivate that. Like what? Little things every day. Okay. How we treat each other. Okay. How we interact. Right. The choices that we make. Yeah. Because every little choice right. can make a difference right. in shifting our perspective. So it's not about like grand gestures it's not necessarily it can be about it can be the smallest things the small things a smile right a kind word right helping someone in need yeah those little things they ripple outwards and they all contribute to that exactly like that larger fish, story that, that grand narrative that grand narrative yeah and they all contribute to creating a more just and compassionate world and i think that's what's so but i think that's what's so important about this idea crucial about it of the deprogrammed body yeah it's not just about saying... Okay. It's not about dwelling on the negative. And we're flowing. It's about recognizing yeah. that we have this incredible capacity for right. both good right. and bad. Right. And that we have the choice to right. choose which one we want to cultivate. And that's... And I think that's... That's real power. That's the heart... That's of, real hope. That we are not bound by some fixed, oh. predetermined nature. Predetermined. We power. have the ability to shape our own destinies, That's both right. individually and right. collectively. But that comes with... But it comes with responsibility. A lot of responsibility. Huge responsibility. Yeah. And he's saying that we can't just be passive about this. No. We can't just sit back and let it happen. We have to be active participants. We have to make conscious choices. Right. Aware of the consequence. Aware of the impact oh, right. of our choices. Yeah. yeah. And choose that path. Wouldn't choose the path towards greater understanding, so, compassion, connection. It's interesting, though, this idea of moving toward the universal. Because well, I... 
It's not easy to misunderstand that, I think. It's easy to think that it's about erasing right. all of our differences right. and becoming <laughs> this yeah. kind of homogenous blob. Yeah. But it's not about that. Right. It's about recognizing that our differences right. are what make us right. beautiful. Right. Interesting what? dynamic. And that there's strength in that. Exactly. There's strength in our diversity. Right. But it's about... But it's about finding that... Common thread. Common thread. That Those, common ground. Yeah. And I love the metaphors that he uses. Oh, they're beautiful. He talks about flowing water. The river. Yeah. The interconnectedness of the river system. It's like yeah. all of these yeah. seemingly separate streams... Right. ...coming together... To create something. To create something larger. Yeah, and themselves. Yeah, themselves. Yeah. It's a beautiful image. He writes... Diverse, we hesitate toward the universal. Our cogitations stir towards the truth, like birds flutter in a whirlwind toward their destination. It's like we're all part of this immense, it's amazing, flowing river of existence, right? We are, and we all bring. We all have our own, our own little current, our own little current, our own unique, our unique perspective. Perspective, exactly. Yeah, it's by embracing that. Yes. That interconnectedness that we can that we can move through the world, navigate the world with more wisdom, with more compassion, more compassion, with more understanding. Yeah, and I think ultimately yeah. that's the yeah. heart of Sarah's message. Yeah, it's a shift in perspective, right? A broadening, right, of understanding yeah. and embrace of both the complexity, right. and the interconnectedness of life. So it's not about looking at life. It's not about simplifying. As these little... He doesn't want us to simplify. Fragments. He wants us to see it. It's about seeing it. In all of its... As this vibrant tapestry. Right. Woven from go, all of these different experiences. All of these threads. Threads of memory. Of memory. Yeah. Of experience. Of possibility. Of possibility. And that brings us back to DNA. Right. Which brings us back to... Because if our own DNA... That DNA... Is this record of transformations. Over millennia. Over billions of years. Right. What are we writing into the future's memory? What are we writing? It's an incredible thought. It's a beautiful thought. That we're not just inheritors of the past. Right. But we are actively shaping. We're actively shaping. The that. future. The future. And oh. that's what I want to leave people with today yeah. is that sense of agency. Yeah. That sense of possibility. Yeah. Because yeah. Yeah. we are not just passengers yeah. on this journey. Oh, we are the yeah. authors. We right. are the creators. Right. And every choice that we make matters wow that's the beauty of it yeah powerful thought to end on and a hopeful one i think it is hopeful because it means that we have the power to create right the future that we want to see it's not predetermined it's not set in stone yeah, it's yeah. up to us us that's right yeah so i mean this has been a really it's been a wonderful conversation a wonderful conversation yeah and i and, think and i think we've just scratched the surface We've only just begun right. to explore the depths of Sarah's. of Sarah's law. Yeah. So for you, the listener, if you're intrigued by this, definitely pick out his work. Pick up Lincoln It's a challenging read, but it's a rewarding one. But it's a rewarding one. Yeah, and it's one of those books that it stays with you. It stays with you. You're still thinking about it long after you've finished it. Right. Weeks, months. Exactly. Late. And, and that's the sign of a good book. It is. The it is. All right. Well, thank you so much for this deep dive. It's been a pleasure. I really appreciate it. And to you, the listener, we'll see you next time. Until next time. <laughs> You're absolutely right. To really understand culture, okay. you have to balance right. both those local specificities right. and our interconnectedness. Right. On a global scale, yeah, yeah. he uses these great examples like agriculture, scientific right. knowledge, mm -hmm. even language right. to show how these global exchanges have shaped us. Okay. So how do we navigate that? Yeah. Because it does feel like this constant- It's tough. Push and pull- That is. Of like wanting to preserve- of course. The uniqueness of certain cultures. Right. But we also have to exist. But also the world is getting smaller. In a global world. It is. And- Sarah's doesn't pretend to have all the answers. Right. But what's interesting is how he uses language as an example. Okay. He talks about how languages are constantly evolving. Right. They borrow words and ideas and concepts from each other. Right. And it really reflects how cultures have mixed 
throughout all of history. Right. It's really fascinating. Well, and I know that resonates with you with all the travel you've done. Yeah. yeah. And the languages that you've learned. Of course. I mean, for me, each language has been a new lens. Right. To see the world through yes. a new way to understand the human experience yeah. and how we communicate. But, yeah. you know, yeah. Sarah's also cautions against this kind of naive yeah. embrace of globalization right. that just erases right. local differences. Right. We also have to value that uniqueness, right. the yeah. unique perspectives and knowledge that right. come from specific cultural contexts. It was not an either or. It's both and. That's, exactly. Yeah, we have to find a way to hold both. Yeah. To recognize the value of each. Yeah. And that leads us to, I think, a more okay. maybe somber but really crucial okay. part of Sarah's thinking. Yeah. He doesn't shy away from the tragic right. dimensions right. of our existence, mm -hmm. both in the natural world and in the cultural world. Right. He sees violence, suffering, even death as like right, yeah. woven into the fabric of life. Right. It's just there. It's part of it. He writes, our individual existence and our cultural histories plunge into the grand narrative along with the walls and the chamois. Yeah. It's this really stark reminder that we're all part of this grand unfolding story. Right. And it has both beauty right. and brutality. Yeah. And I think that's where this idea of homo humilis comes in. Exactly. Right. The humble human. It's yeah. like, we need that humility to face this reality. Yes, exactly. This reality of interconnectedness with all of it. Yes. You know, the joy and the suffering. It's all part of it. Yeah. We can't have one without the other. And we need that humility to face uh, recognizing each other right. you know, with all of our flaws and our differences. And our shared humanity. Exactly. Yeah. Sarah sees this homo humilis as the antidote okay. to that arrogance mm -hmm. that also comes with yeah. human achievement. Right. You know, a, a truly global perspective yeah. means moving beyond just our own narrow self-interest right. and embracing this yeah. shared responsibility for mm -hmm. humanity and for the planet. Which is a really radical thought in a world that's obsessed with, you know, exactly. the individual and individual mm -hmm. achievement. The self, yeah. yeah. That's... So how do we cultivate that, yeah. that homo humilis perspective? It's the question. Yeah. It's yeah. a big question. And Sayers doesn't offer easy answers. But he does offer us these beautiful er, metaphors for okay. this journey toward the universal. He uses dance, music. He even uses the image of flowing water okay. to illustrate this movement right. toward greater understanding and connection. Wow. He writes, diverse, we hesitate toward the universal. Our cogitations stir toward the truth like birds flutter in a whirlwind toward their destination. Right. It's this constant striving and reaching for something larger but than I, ourselves. Yeah. Wow. So we've covered a lot of ground here. We've talked about mountains as these memory palaces. Yes. We've gone into the depths of our DNA. Mm -hmm. We've looked at the vastness of time, the balance of the local and the global. Yes. The hard realities, the difficult realities of the human condition. Yes. So if we were to just distill it, like what's the big takeaway? That's a great question. What does Sayers want us to grapple with? What does he want us to grapple with? I think at the heart of it is this idea that we are not just separate individuals, but part of this vast interconnected web of being and that our memories, our experiences are not just personal, but they're also collective and they're woven into the very fabric of the cosmos. So what does that mean for us? Yeah, I mean, like it feels hopeful. But there's this weight to it, right? There is, because it's not a passive hope. Right. It's an active hope. Okay, how so? Because it requires effort on our part. Right. It requires us to be aware, to be willing yeah. to engage. And I think this is where his idea of moving towards the universal fits in. Okay. It's not about erasing our differences. Right. But it's about building those bridges. Right. It's about finding that common ground because ultimately that's the only way forward. Yeah. And he's asking us to do this. He is. In the face of yes. knowing that there is suffering in the world. He's not asking us to shy away from it. Right. He's asking us to face it head on. Right. But to do it yeah. with this understanding yeah. of our interconnectedness right. and our shared humanity. And I think right. that's a really right. powerful. It is a powerful message. It is. So he's not sugarcoating anything. No, no sugarcoating. But he's also saying that there's a way 
But there's a possibility. Forward. There, there's always possibility. A lot of that has to do with how we view exactly ourselves, ourselves in relation to the world, in relation to each other. That's yeah. what he keeps coming back to. Yeah, and that homo humilis. Yes. It's a choice. It's yeah. a choice. It's a way of being. Yeah. It's a way of seeing. Yeah. It's a way of acting. And that's hopeful. It is hopeful. Yeah. And you know what's even more hopeful? Is yeah. It gives us these concrete things we can do. Okay. To cultivate that. Like what? Little things every day. Like I mean, how we treat each other. Yeah. How we interact. Right. The choices that we make. Yeah. Because every little choice right. can make a difference. Right. In shifting our perspective. Yeah. So it's not about like grand gestures. Not necessarily. It can yeah. be the smallest things. The small things. A smile. Right. A kind word. Right. Helping someone in need. Yeah. Those little things, they ripple outwards. And they all contribute to that. Exactly. Larger story. That grand narrative. That grand narrative. Yeah. And they all contribute to creating right. a more yeah. just and compassionate world. And I think that's what's so... And I think that's what's so... Important about this idea. Crucial about it. Yeah. Of the deprogrammed body. Yeah. It's not just about saying. It's not about dwelling on the negative. We're flawed. It's about recognizing yeah. that we have this incredible capacity for yeah. both good and bad. Right. And that we have the choice to choose right. which one we want to cultivate. And, and I think that is real power. That's the heart. That's real hope. Of his message that we are not bound by some fixed right. predetermined nature. Predetermined. We have the ability to shape yeah. Our own destinies. Right. Both individually right. and collectively. I thought that comes with... But it comes with responsibility. A lot of responsibility. Huge responsibility. Yeah, and he's saying that we can't just be passive about this. No. We can't just sit back and let it happen. We have to be active participants. We have to make conscious choices. Right. Aware of the consequences. Aware of the impact of our choices. Yeah, and choose that path. Choose the path towards greater understanding towards compassion right connect it's interesting though this idea of moving toward the universal because I, it's not about it's easy to misunderstand that i think it's easy to think that it's about erasing right. all of our differences right. and becoming yeah. this kind of homogenous homogenous blob right. but it's not about that right. it's about recognizing yeah. that our differences are yeah. what make us beautiful yeah. right interesting I, dynamic and that there's strength in that Exactly. There's strength in our diversity. Right. But it's about... But it's about finding that... That common thread. Common thread, that common ground. Yeah. And I love the metaphors that he uses. Oh, they're beautiful. He talks about flowing water. The river. Yeah. The interconnectedness of the river system. Right. It's like all of these yeah. seemingly separate streams like, coming together. To create something. Create something larger. Yeah, than themselves. Than yeah. themselves, yeah. It's a beautiful image, he writes. Diverse, we hesitate toward the universal. Mm -hmm. Our cogitations stir towards the truth like birds flutter in a whirlwind toward their destination. It's like we're all part of this immense yeah. it's some flowing river of existence, right? We now. are. And we all bring... We all have our own... Our own huh? little current. Our own little current. Whoa. Our own unique... Our unique perspective. Perspective. To a receptor. It and it's by embracing that, yes, that interconnectedness, that we can that we can move through the world, navigate the world with more wisdom, with more compassion, more compassion, with more understanding. Yeah, and I think ultimately that's yeah. the heart of Sarah's message. Yeah, it's a shift in perspective, right. a broadening of understanding, yeah. an embrace of both the complexity right. and the interconnectedness of life. So it's not about looking at life. It's not about simplifying. They're these little... He doesn't want us to simplify. Fragments. He wants us to see it. It's about seeing it. In all of it. It's this vibrant tapestry. It's right. It's woven from yeah. all of these different experiences. All of these threads. Threads of memory. Of memory. Of experience. Now of possibility. Of possibility. And that brings us back to DNA. Right. Which brings us back to... Because if our own DNA... That DNA... Is this record of transformations... Over millennia? Over billions of years. Well, what what are we writing into the future's memory? What are we writing? It's an incredible thought. It's a beautiful thought. That we're not just inheritors of the past. Right. But we are actively 
shaping. We're actively shaping the future. The future. And that's what I want to leave people with today. Yeah. Is that sense of agency. Yeah. That sense of possibility. Because yeah. Yeah. we are not just passengers right. on this journey. That's right. We are the authors. The authors. We are the creators. Right. And every choice that we make matters. Wow. What a that's the beauty of it. Yeah. Powerful thought to end on. And a hopeful one, I think. It is hopeful. Because it means that we have the power to create right. the future that we want to see. It's not predetermined. It's not set in stone. Yeah. It's up to us. Us. Yeah. That's right. So, I mean, this has been a really... It's been a wonderful conversation. Wonderful conversation. Yeah. And I think... And I think... We've just scratched the surface. We've only just begun... Right. ...to explore the depths... Of Sarah. Of Sarah's thought. Yeah. So for you, the listener, if you're intrigued by this, mm -hmm. definitely... Check out his work. Pick up Lynn Kendison. <laughs> it's a challenging read, but it's a rewarding one. But it's a rewarding one, right? And it's one of those books that... It stays with you. It stays with you. You're still thinking about it. Long after you finished it. Right. We and Months later. Deck. And that's the sign of a good book. It is. It is. All right. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. For this deep dive. It's been a pleasure. I really appreciate it. And to you, the listener, we'll see you next time. Until next time.